Sabine Hossenfelder is one of the most effective science communicators on YouTube right now, and she recently tweeted a prediction about what the human race will actually do about climate change that I thought was interesting, important, and well worth discussing here. So that's what we're going to do. Before we start, if you are interested in science, Sabine's channel is gold, if you didn't already know it. She's a physicist by training, but does videos on a range of science and related topics with a lot of attention to detail and a certain irreverent wit. I like the fact that she says what she thinks without fear nor favour and without much worrying about whether it will upset a tribe that has invested its identity on whatever issue it is that she's discussing. Viewers of this channel will know that that is exactly the spirit that I try to bring here, so I give credit when I see someone else who is doing it extremely well. And what Sabine does in this tweet that we're going to talk about is that she predicts what's going to happen, not what she wishes would happen. This is one of the things you can do that will annoy lots of people, because for many of them, they are permanently in campaign mode, suggesting something will happen that is not the optimum of what they're campaigning to happen, that is seen by them as making it more likely that they will fail. Don't mention the bad thing, because if you do, that in itself will make the bad thing happen. If we could all just conspire never to mention the bad thing, it won't even occur to anyone and therefore it won't happen. Obviously, this is the logic of children at play. If I cover my eyes, then that means you can't see me. But everyone is in campaign mode so routinely they are incapable of making the distinction between predicting that a thing will happen and arguing that that's what you want to happen. Unless you're painting, of course, the apocalyptic vision that you're trying to prevent. But in any case, it's always a prediction calculated to have an impact on how people act, not just trying to work out what's likely to happen. So, that all being said... Let's look at the meat of her Twitter comments recently, prompted by COP28, amongst other things. Yes, our climate targets will fail, because plans to meet them are mostly empty words. They are slightly slowing down the developments, though, so still better than nothing. Of course, we should keep on trying, and of course, activists will keep on insisting the impossible is possible, and then complain that no one is listening to them. It's a statement of the bleeding obvious if you look at the tortured progress of public policy in this area that the ambitious climate targets are going to fail to be achieved. To think otherwise, you'd have to be able to look at this graph and convince yourself that the trajectory it describes for the point from this point forwards is entirely natural and within sight and likely to happen. But as Sabine says, the actions that are being taken are slowing things down, they should be continued. I actually think her phrasing is a little pessimistic here. If you let go of the fixed belief that nothing beyond keeping below 1.5 degrees Celsius is unthinkable, then it does seem to me that the human race will make solid future progress on this with the known variables in play. But not as fast as they say they wish to go, because the actions, often for good reason, because we're dealing with trade-offs, not a single variable problem, they are slower than they would need to be. Now, I love Sabine's line about the activists insisting the impossible is possible and then complaining no one is listening to them. Back to the tweet. The reason all this climate talk goes nowhere is that most climate activists misidentify the source of the problem. It's not a technological problem, we have known how to avoid climate change since we've learned of it. The problem is that we have no system to convert this knowledge into collective action. The only global system that we have to aggregate information and coordinate actions to use resources are free market economies. And for those to work, we'd have had to put a price on carbon dioxide emissions, which we did not. This is 
so much to the heart of it. The problem isn't a single variable carbon emissions, it's a systems problem. How does the human race organise itself to survive and thrive on a finite planet whose resources can be optimised beyond often what we can imagine, but nevertheless do ultimately remain limited? People totally underestimate this because they think it's just a policy question. Come up with a policy to do X. Do the policy. X is the problem solved. Well, there are some problems you can solve like that. There are many problems, in fact. But this one is bigger and more integrated into all the things we do and how we survive and thrive in the first place. Through history, we have tried alternatives to free markets as a system. Communism being the main one once the human race has achieved a certain scale and it failed spectacularly because mostly it relied on people being how we would wish them to be, not how they actually are. And many of the solutions put forward by the activists look vulnerable to the same fundamental flaw. Get everyone to be vegan. Well, they won't be vegan. More of them are eating meat now than ever before, so reframe the system question you're trying to solve if you're being serious. And yes, Sabine is right that for free market economies to solve a problem like this, you have to factor what are called externalities into the market price. If I can produce a product really cheap, but it means polluting the air that you breathe, well, that's great for my profit, but of course it created harm and cost elsewhere to you, and that's a market failure. If the pollution is unavoidable, which usually it's not, of course, but for the sake of argument, then you would want to build the cost of cleaning it up into the price of the product, and that is then reflected the true price of that product. That provides the incentive for the producers to find alternative ways of production that don't create the same high costs. And if they can't, well, maybe that product just isn't viable if you can't produce it for a price that people are prepared to pay. Now, that's all very well in theory. But if your entire world economy has been built on relatively cheap and plentiful energy, then simply waking up to a problem one day and whacking on a huge, great carbon tax probably going to have lots of unintended consequences all the way down the chain. Which is why human societies have pondered the question and have consistently not done it to the extent that would actually tackle the problem. So this is where Sabine now gets to the prediction part. It is not hard to predict what is going to happen from here on because the default mode of humans is simply to keep on doing what they've been doing. This is why carbon capture and storage and carbon dioxide removal, e.g. BEX, will become increasingly widespread because they'll allow nations to keep on doing what they're doing. Obviously, that's a message a lot of people, the campaigners specifically, hate to hear. And Sabine addresses the kickback directly. I see in my mentions that some people insist I must be dumb for not understanding that CCS and CDR are costly, ineffective and unlikely to scale. Well, yes, I am so dumb that I said this in a video two years ago. I am not saying it's a good solution. I'm simply saying it's how it will go because it's the closest we can manage to a market for carbon. And fossil fuel companies know this full well. So this is a prediction based on how human societies tend to behave and the default choices that we will be left with, not the optimum choices that everyone is arguing about. And the prediction isn't made saying that it's therefore not worth the effort to get a better outcome, but that this is the likely outcome, or at least the baseline, that maybe we could marginally improve on. Now, of course, many people will look at the current understanding of the science of climate change and say, this just isn't going to get the job done. And that's addressed in the next part. And since that is very unlikely to keep global warming below 3 degrees, we'll end up doing stratospheric aerosol injections. Again, a stupid thing to do. 
I'm not saying we should do it. I am merely saying this is what I think will happen. Why? Because it's cheap and we know how to do it. And the more we think about it, the more appealing it will look. She finishes by making clear her own position on what should happen, distinguished from her prediction of what will happen. If you want to know what I think we should do, well, I've said this before. Expand solar, wind and most importantly nuclear, CCS on fossil fuel plants, upgrade the electric grids, stop wasting money on nonsense, like for example those COP meetings. I find a lot in her prediction that is compelling. The basic principle, people try to keep doing what they already do. And the less good solutions that are the easiest to do will be the ones that get defaulted to. I think that's a solid basis for a prediction. For people who think that if only they can shout a bit louder, if only they could do some even more disruptive protests, that will mean that suddenly everyone will decide it's a climate emergency and that will mean they suddenly start behaving in fundamentally different ways. However you think it is they should behave, it would actually make a difference. It's not going to happen. Oh, and the people who think that if only we can pretend that climate change doesn't exist at all, that it will turn out all to have been a hoax. Wishful thinking has a even worse historical track record than even communism. So good luck with that. I think there are things that Sabine doesn't cover that are built into her scenario. At some point, international relations get really ugly over this. Developing countries, particularly those in Africa and parts of Asia, where the impact of climate change will be worst felt, they feel very much done to, and they want wealthy countries, who they feel are the doing parties, to buy them out of trouble. That hope is also against the grain of how this system has ever worked in the past. There will be some support. It will be commensurate with the level of support that there has been in the past in terms of foreign aid. No more, probably no less. And as people start to finally accept that this is happening too slowly to avoid the climate outcomes that many of them have been catastrophizing about and building themselves into a frenzy about, as the system designed to achieve major changes is confronted with its relative failure, it'll go through a crisis. Something new will emerge from that crisis, and probably, as Sabine says, it will be new energy and acceptance behind the less good solutions that were previously dismissed out of hand. But, you know, there are other questions. How would they agree to govern... That geoengineering part, the stratospheric aerosol injections, as we've noted before, tricky. Because there might be real winners and losers in that process based on localised impacts. Navigating that will be geopolitically lively, to say the least. I don't think it's inevitable, though. I do think that based on imperfect information that China's emissions will peak within the next couple of years and start to decline from a pretty high base, obviously, if global emissions do likewise on a not too far off time scale, then the sense of the direction of travel might change a number of attitudes, might make panicked measures less likely. Particularly also because at some point, the activists asking the impossible will move on to other issues, other topics, or just I don't know, decide to get a job and maybe become part of the solution. No protest movements maintain intensity for an extended period, especially when they're not being particularly effective. But there it is. What do you think of Sabine's prediction? Do you think it's likely to come true? First question, then totally separate question. What do you wish would be the outcome? in your ideal world, assuming your ideal world can't just, you know, rewrite the laws of physics and solve the problem that way, which I know some of you would dearly wish. Put your thoughts on all of that in the comments below.